And it's good to be back on Sunday morning with a choir. And I'm glad that, glad that you're here. Some of you haven't seen each other in a year. And so uh, we're going to exchange our senior class pictures <laughs> so you can all get to know each other again. Uh, but I'm glad that you're here this morning. This morning we are eventually going to get uh, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and to Romans chapter 6. But uh, we're going to talk this morning about the life of faith in the Christ-centered life, the life of faith. Tonight, uh, we'll be in Nehemiah chapter 1 on the prayer that we need to pray for the next great work at Sherwood. What kind of prayer do we need to pray for the next great work at Sherwood? And there'll be an update uh, from the transition team tonight as a part of the service. We'll have House of Prayer where you can come and, uh, and pray for others and pray for our transition team. But I look forward to being uh, back with you tonight as we look at the Word. Everything about the life of faith is about focus and about purpose and about surrender. We live in uncertain times. There's, there's no doubt about that. And anybody that says that they know exactly what's going to happen is really taking way too many drugs. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, everything seems to be in a turmoil. Everybody seems to be confused. People are filled with fear. And if that becomes the narrative of our lives... We lose not only the joy of our salvation, but we lose the hope of our salvation. Because all of that is built in the life of faith. You know, when you read the Bible, it is a book of walking by faith. No matter what's going on, no matter what's happening, it is trusting in the Lord. And, and the facts of our frustration are real. We wonder... Will anything ever get to where I just can sit down and rest in the Lord? But when you're frustrated, the question has to come. Where do I turn? Who do I look at? What am I looking for? When I'm frustrated with life, we need to understand that faith is born out of frustration and desperation. And growth personal spiritual growth is formed out of frustration and desperation. And revival is birthed out of frustration and desperation. And miracles are birthed out of frustration and desperation. You read the miracles of the, in the Gospels and you will find that there was frustration and desperation until they got to Jesus no religion could help them. No Pharisee could help them. No Sadducee could help them. But when they got to Jesus, there was hope. And even one said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And all of us find ourselves in those moments in life where we believe, but we need God to help us in our unbelief. You see, the end of self is the beginning of the Christ-centered life. When I get to the end of myself, it is the beginning of the Christ-centered life because it's no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Until we get desperate, we rarely walk by faith. Until we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we fill our appetite with things that don't fill us. Spiritual junk food. We find a source outside of ourselves that is sufficient only when that source is in the Savior. And so, where are you right now? Have you lost your joy? Have you lost your sense of purpose? Is your time alone with the Lord gone flat or inconsistent or off and on? Are you wondering if God has a future for you? Are you panicked about what's going on in this world? What is it that preoccupies 
your mind, and your heart. You see, the faith life is a life of lordship. When, uh, when, when you're dealing with the matter of lordship, you have to understand that Savior is used 24 times in the Bible and Lord is used 644 times in the Bible. In fact, in one concordance, when you take, when God the Father is referred to as Lord in the Old Testament, it takes 51 pages in a concordance to cover all the references to God being Lord. Uh, he's not trying to be Lord. He's not hoping to be Lord. He is Lord. And he's Lord of our circumstances and he's Lord of this earth and he is Lord of this nation and people can boast and strut and do whatever they want to do. But at the end of time, there's going to be one person on the throne and that's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And every knee is going to bow down to him. So if I can learn in this life to live by faith in that God who has made so many promises to me, it'll be a game changer. If I surrender to his infinite love, that's what lordship is. It is a surrender to his infinite love. Surrendering to lordship is a step of faith. I believe that God has something he wants to do with my life. And when I, he is my Lord, it's not that he wants to hurt me, it's that he wants to love me. He wants to show me his love. Living outside of lordship is not the normal Christian life. It's the abnormal Christian life. It's the subnormal Christian life. Jesus died to give us an abundant and victorious life, and we cannot have that if our hearts are divided. It, it can't be worked up. You can't read enough books. It's a, it's a step of faith. Romans 14, 9 says, For this reason, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord. The secret of the Christ-centered life, the secret of faith, the secret of victory, the secret of overcoming, the secret of the spirit-filled life is faith. You see, you can live a good life in your own strength. You really can. There are a lot of good people that live in their own strength. And you can live a somewhat good life in your own strength. But can I tell you, from personal experience, it's exhausting. Because you're always trying to be good or gooder or better. And you always are realizing you can't do it. So you try to be gooder and gooder and better and better. You can do it for a while, but it will exhaust you. Your strength is not a help to God. By the way, your ideas are no help to God. Uh, he, he's not asking your permission. <laughs> he, he's not asking your help in running the universe. He's asking your surrender and your cooperation, and that's faith. That's faith. Now, just think about it. If God didn't need your help in salvation, he doesn't need your help in sanctification. He needs your surrender and your cooperation. That's all he needs. He needs your surrender and your cooperation for you and I to get in line with what he wants to do with our lives that we can fulfill the potential that he has for us in Christ Jesus. Some people are enslaved to drugs and alcohol and pornography. Other people are just enslaved to trying to be good people or rules or religion or tradition. But at the end of the day, it's all enslavement to an impossible life. Some microphone just died. Oh, it was a horn that died. It was an iPad that died. Man, I hate it when the iPad dies. Let's just have a moment of silence. <laughs> you see, if I think I can help Jesus out, he can't help me. If I think I can help Jesus out, he cannot help me. Because he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
Years ago, I found a list in a little book that is now, I've read it so many times, I've worn it out, and the, the binding is all broken on it. There's not one page that's stuck to another page called the uh, Seven Last Words of the Flesh. These are the seven last words of the flesh. I will do it for you, Jesus. And then this is what the author said. I, by my own ability and energy, will, for my glory, do, because good works make me feel good, it, because I don't mind the hard task, for, Lord, you just stand aside, you, because you need my help, Jesus, aren't you fortunate to have me? And I'm, I'm going to tell you, there's too often when we live our lives that way. And all of us, left to ourselves, we, we, we can develop the idea that God is fortunate to have us. And what a blessing we are to him, for him to have us. What would he do without us? Still run the universe? He'd still be in charge. He would still be at peace with himself and at oneness with his son and with his spirit. And he still has a plan in place. Faith is not a feeling. Faith works best when all the other options are off the table. Faith is not a feeling. George Mueller said, it is the very time for faith to work when sight ceases. When a need came up, it is said that Mueller would often say, people would bring a need to him, and Mueller would often say, well, we will have to trust the Lord. If you're waiting for a feeling, you will never learn to walk by faith. Feelings are not the victory. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. When we operate by feelings, can, can I tell you what we do when we are? That when we operate by feelings, we are really God's children in the back seat of the van or the SUV, complaining and whining until God gives us a pacifier or a cell phone or an iPad to entertain us. Because feelings can only be satisfied by stuff. Faith satisfies what's inside of us that cannot be satisfied by stuff. You can get all the stuff in the world, but you won't be satisfied because then you just feel like, I just want more you know and I, I can remember when our kids were growing up and they you know we'd go on a long trip and uh you know they'd start crying to pull the pacifier out just stick the pacifier in their mouth and and then watch them and you know watch them flip it you know <laughs> flip it around their mouth just flip it around their tongue and, and they're just going back and forth and uh that would work until we would start playing some music that they didn't like and we take that Disney tape out or something put something in we wanted to listen to that the adults driving them to their destination <laughs> wanted to listen to or as I said one time you get your own car you can listen to your own music but when you're in my car you're gonna listen to my music I mean that's the way this works that's why I pay the bills that's why I, I provide the bed and that's that's why in fact I'm the reason you have a life so, uh, <laughs> everything in the Christian life is by faith. We are saved by faith. We walk by faith. We are kept by faith. We are sustained by faith. We fight the good fight of faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Galatians 3.14, we receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The Christ-centered life is not a magic pill. It is a walk of faith. It's his presence in the pressures of life. It's living in his promises. How I feel has nothing to do with the promises of God. A lot of times I'm reading the Bible and I don't feel like that promise is true. It doesn't change it. It's still the promise of God. I'm to appropriate and to apply them by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Paul is going through this list of battles he's fighting and the pressure that he is under. 
And, and if you want to put your problems into perspective, read what Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians 4. Let's, let's go to verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Listen, it takes walking through a battle to know that God is sufficient. It takes walking through a battle to know that, that where you put your faith matters. In the crisis, Christ is revealed. The world is looking for what comes out of us when we are squeezed. How do we respond? Do we respond with faith or do we respond in a panic? Our lives, as the hymn Amazing Grace says, are filled with dangers, toils, and snares. And that's just the way life is. Tests come because you're breathing. But we have to learn to settle down and rest in the Lord and ask him that he would manifest the life of Christ in our lives in good times and in bad times. Listen, either we must do it ourselves or Jesus must do it for us. Jesus came to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. So our job is simple. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Here's the principle. Victory is something done for you, not by you. The victory is won by Christ. It's something done for you. We, we look for experiences and we look for feelings. We need to stand in a victory that is already won. We need to stop looking for feelings to confirm the work of God. God's working whether we feel like he's working or not. Uh, I remember, and I've told this story multiple times in 31 years here, uh, the lady that came up to Ron Dunn and said, Oh, Brother Dunn, I wish you had been here uh, when God was working. And Ron said, What you're really saying is I wish you had been here when God was acting like I want him to act. He's always working. Just sometimes he's working silently. And sometimes he's working in a way different than you think he ought to work. The sin that hinders us from the Christ-centered life is unbelief. Faith is built on promises. We keep asking God over and over to give us something he's already given us. Listen, what the scripture says is what God says. What God says in his word is for you, and it's for me. His presence, his power, his peace are all based on promises. We stand on the promises of God. Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Now, we won't dive too deeply into this, but I want to read it because I think it's important. Romans 6 in verse 3, or do you not know, of course you do, that's the implication, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, in light of that, what we know, therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. That's what we picture every time we baptize somebody. Amen. Verse 5, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, 
certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now Romans 6 talks a lot about knowing the things that we know. We are not ignorant of the promises of God. We're not ignorant of the principles of God. We're not ignorant of the processes that God takes us through. Our justification in Christ is not just a legal transaction of God justifying us in Christ just as if we had never sinned. It's not just a legal transaction. It's a relational transaction. It's a personal transaction. It gives meaning. It gives purpose. Now, let me, let me give you two thoughts here. They're not going to come up on the screen. Looking to Christ crucified, we obtain pardon. When I look to Christ in his crucifixion, I obtain pardon, salvation. When I look to Christ in his resurrection, I obtain power for a sanctified life, for a life of faith. It infuses us with power. Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. We've been given the promise of a power that makes it possible to live the kind of life the Bible talks about. Don't ever open your Bible and say, those promises are for somebody else, but they're not for me. There's a reason you have that Bible in your hand. There's a reason you need to read it. There's a reason that you need to highlight it. The promises of God are true. Man is a liar, but God is true to his word. He keeps his word. What what does that look like if he gives me this kind of life? Well, it looks like the Beatitudes. It it looks like the fruit of the Spirit. The emphasis of Romans 6, 3, and 4 is on death and resurrection. Our death and our resurrection. Our death to self and our resurrection to a new life in Christ. We don't have to live the old way. We don't have to live with stinking thinking. We can live a new life, not just in the future. People say, well, you know, one day we're going to be resurrected. The dead in Christ are going to rise, and and we're going to be resurrected. Jesus has promised us a resurrection power life now, not just for the future, right now. You and I can walk in a power that we cannot work up on our own. It is a power that was given to you the day you were saved when the Holy Spirit came to dwell inside of you. And the Bible says that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have the power inside of you, not on your flesh, not in your trying harder. You have the power inside of you to live in the power of the Holy Spirit and to walk in victory. And all of that is by faith. I have to choose to believe what God says. It's here and now. The life we are promised doesn't come by trying harder. It comes by a gracious God who loves us and gave himself for us. The victory is not something you grow into. It is a gift freely given. And let me tell you, if he can't give you victory, your Savior is an insufficient Savior. And you're reading the wrong book. Because the Savior that is talked about in the Word of God is sufficient for every moment of our lives. Somebody asked Ron Dunn uh, one day, said, do you you have uh, dying grace? He said, no, I don't. And he said, oh, you don't have dying grace? He said, no, because I don't need it right now. He said, but the day I need it, I'll have it. That's the walk of faith. 
That's the walk of faith. Knowing that God will provide for you what you need when you need it. He, he's not going to give you dying grace for a moment when you're not dying. He's going to give you dying grace for the moments when you are facing death. What do you need from God? Whatever you need, he is. Who will I tell them sent me, said Moses. And God said, you tell them I am sent you. What did Jesus say? I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the resurrection and life. Whatever you need, the I am is what you need in this life. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul said, thanks be to God who gives us the victory. We don't work it up. We don't just try really hard to be victorious. We, we don't call in uh, the troops to help us be victorious. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Your victory is not in how many people you can get around you. Your victory is in Christ. And if you're alone on a deserted island, your victory is in Christ. If you're surrounded by friends and family, your victory is still in Christ. Now, encouragement may come from other people. But your victory to live the life that God wants you to live is in Christ. Not in what you do, but what he has already done for you. The Bible says the battle is not yours, it's the Lord. He's the bread of life. He's the water of life. The psalmist talks about he's, he's your bread, he's your life. I mean, you read Psalm 119 and see all that God promises to be through the word of God. Now, let me, let me just wrap up here with uh, 1 John 5, 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Is this life possible? Yes, it is. It's possible. Because the victory that overcomes the world is our faith. That's the victory. John is not speaking about a victory after we're dead. He's speaking about a victory in the here and now. That we walk a victorious life. Listen, there's no other way to explain the disciples who all ran for cover on the night of Jesus' betrayal and hid, and none were at the cross except for John. There's no other way to explain what happened at Pentecost, and they went out, and all of them were martyred for their faith. They believed the promises of God. They had power. This is the victory, our faith. It's not that they become better men. They became better believers. They believed the promises of of God. Faith is a living thing. The life of peace and joy and freedom is found in the Prince of Peace who has overcome death and hell and the grave. He is not stressing out about any disease or any government or any plot in fact, the psalmist says he laughs at the nations and he is a God who rules and overrules. Nobody gets the last word except Jesus. Well, I'd like to give my opinion. Your opinion doesn't count. Jesus is the only opinion that matters. He's the only one that matters. Paul said, I live, but not I, but Christ lives in me. John said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So let me drive the point home here. The Christ-centered life is not you trying harder. It's you trusting more. It's you turning over your life to trust Jesus with your life. As long as you think you can handle it, you'll never live the life 
of faith. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment before we have a moment of invitation. And, and with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to ask you to do what I've asked you to do a hundred times. Just in your seat, just draw a circle around your life and just listen for a moment. Just your life, not the person next to you, not the person behind you, not somebody you think that ought to be here. The life of quiet, the life of faith, there's only one question. What would my Lord have me to do? That's it. If you're going to live the life of faith, there's only one question you need to ask. What would my Lord have me to do? And your answer needs to be, Lord, whatever you would have me to do, I'll do. You know, wherever he leads, I'll go. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Secondly, you need to admit, Lord, I can't do this unless you enable me. I can't do it unless you enable me. You can trust an unknown future to a known God. But you can't do it. You, you can't deal with it unless God enables you. God has to enable you by faith. Remember what Manley said faith is? Faith is believing that it's so when it's not so. Because God said so, so that it would be so. Remember the man in the Bible that said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. So right now, right where you are, I want to ask you to do something. Some of you, if you're honest, you would say, Lord, I believe you can save me, but I'm not sure because I've done so much. I've sinned so much. I've, I've just played games with you. Help my unbelief. Some of you would say, Lord, I, I believe you can help me with this habit, but I'm not really sure it'll work. Help my unbelief. What, what's your fill in the blank? Lord, I believe you can, but. And then turn that into a prayer. Lord, help my unbelief. Lord, I believe you know, but. Help my unbelief. Lord, I know what the promises in the Word of God say, but help my unbelief. Lord, I've heard that you can save me, but I, I don't feel saved. I, I don't think I'm saved. I don't know I'm saved. Help my unbelief. Today could be your day of salvation. You can nail it down today. Lord, I believe that there's a step of faith that I need to take. Help my unbelief. Lord, I believe that, that you can bring my prodigal home. Help my unbelief. Lord, I believe that you can restore that which the locusts have eaten. Help my unbelief. Lord, I believe that your promises are true, but when I get out of church, I begin to forget. Help my unbelief. Lord, I believe that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. But sometimes I just am not sure that applies to me. I believe it's a Bible promise. But I'm not sure it applies to me. Help my unbelief. What is it that you need God to help you with today so that you can live the life of faith? In a moment, I'm going to pray. We're going to stand. Our men are going to be here at the front. If you need to trust Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, they will be here. If you need to just say, I need to see a counselor and pray with somebody, I need assurance of my salvation. I, I, I'm just really struggling with something and you need somebody to pray with you, we can do that. But don't miss this moment taking a step of faith. You say, well, what is a step of faith? For some of you, it's just moving from the seat you're in 
toward the front. That's your first step of faith. And believing that God's going to help you make the rest of it. So I'm going to pray. When I'm through praying, then we're going to stand. The praise team's going to sing. And I'm going to ask you to step out and come. Father, in the name of Jesus, help us to be people of faith. Help us to be people that stand on the promises of a victory that has already been won at the cross and at the empty tomb. Remind us that every promise of God is yes and amen. For we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. You come while we sing. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my today, we need you for tomorrow, and we need you for all eternity. So may our hope be in you, not in our flesh, not in our strength, not in our ideas, but in you, because you are a loving Father who has our best interest in mind. And you died and rose to give us a life we could never have on our own. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. You be seated. Garrett. Such a great word for us uh, this morning. And I just encourage you, if you're here today and God was speaking to your heart, for whatever reason, you didn't respond to the invitation, but you know that you currently are separated from God and you need him to be Lord and Savior of your life. 
I encourage you out in our atrium as a next step desk. We'd love to meet you there as pastors to be able to share with you the gospel message. And you can walk off of this property knowing that he is your savior and Lord of your life. That he has sealed your eternity, given you new life for today and also for eternity. If it's uh, beyond salvation in other areas, again, and God's just stirring in you, you'd like for us to pray with you, we'd love to meet you there. And also, if you're new to Sherwood, thank you so much for being here today. We have a welcome desk out there. I'd love to give you a gift.